Okay, so let's pick up where we ended off yesterday. Yesterday we ended talking about coupling constants, or sorry, multiplicity and uh, spin spin coupling. And we talked about looking for two or three bond neighbors. And I said if you've got one three bond neighbor, your signal gets split into a doublet. If you've got two three bond neighbors, it gets split into a triplet. Three three bond neighbors, you get split into a quartet. What happens if you have four four bond neighbors? A pentad. So basically, all you do is take the number of three bond neighbors that you have, add one onto that, and that will tell you the signal shape. So does it get split into one peak, two peaks, three peaks, four peaks, five peaks, six peaks, seven peaks, and so on. If you look at the NMR cheat sheet that I gave you, this shows what the signal shapes should look like, right? This is a really good guide while you're first learning NMR so you can decipher what the signal shapes mean. If you look at the bottom too, there's another signal shape that says multiplet. Multiplet is basically just an indicator that the signal shape isn't super clear and it's hard to interpret. That's all it means. Try not to read too much into multiplets, especially on our uh, lab activity. All right, and then when we finished off we looked at this example, we looked at ethanol, and we said with ethanol we had three different types of protons. We had HA, HB, HC. We said HA had no three bond neighbors, so it gets split into a singlet, or not split for that matter. HB only has three three bond neighbors, so it gets split into a quartet. It can't go through that oxygen because it's not a carbon. And then HC only has two three bond neighbors, so it gets split into a triplet. All right, what we're going to do today is look more closely at these spectra. So if you look at these peaks for ethanol, for HC and HB in particular, HB, we said, was a quartet. HC is a triplet. There's some more information we can gain out of this. If you notice, the triplet kind of looks like a trident a little bit, or a three-pronged fork. The distance in between the prongs tells you a lot of information, and that's called the coupling constant. So what we're going to start out today with is coupling constant determination, or deciphering. And I'll give you guys an easy example for our first one. The first example I have is with an alkene, where we've got fluorine and chlorine coming off of one side, and two protons. How many proton signals should we get? Two? Why two? Yeah, they're each in a different chemical environment. There's no planes of symmetry, so they're not mere images of one another. Each of these will be different, right? So we could identify this as maybe HA. We could identify this one as HB. What will HA be split as? Will it be a singlet, doublet, triplet, or a quartet? It'll be a doublet, right? It has one three bond neighbor. Because it has one three bond neighbor, we add one onto that, which means our peak will be split into two. We know that that is represented by a doublet. All right, and then HB will also be a doublet because it only has one three bond neighbor. So if we look at these, we could draw our anticipated signals and we could say, all right, we get a doublet for HA. We get a doublet for HB. Were they all nope, they'd show up at different resonant frequencies because they're each in different environments, right? However, what we can do is we can measure the distance between these prongs. If you look at them, can you, I know my drawings aren't world class here but they're roughly the same distance apart, right? These are called coupling constant. So let's make some notes here. HA splits HB. Into a doublet. And then HB splits HA into a doublet. <coughs> 
the main takeaway is that the splitting, whoa, occurs at the same magnitude. Whoa, sorry. Since they split each other. That is to say that this width right here is going to be the same width as that splitting pattern, right? It makes a lot of sense, and oftentimes when we are referring to coupling constants, we call them J values. So, for example, the distance could be defined as JAB, meaning you've got some coupling constant of a specific width. And that's going to be the same cu coupling constant as JBC, right? They just occur at the same width. All right, now let's take a look at a more complicated example. Just a real quick question. If uh, you replace the flooring with, say, bromine, would it change the distance between the coupling constants? If you change what? Like, instead of fluorine, you say you had bromine. Would that change the distance between the coupling constants? It can have an effect, yeah. But the main thing is that we can use uh, patterns that have the same width between their forks to match them up with one another, and we can say, well, because they have that same coupling constant, they're likely splitting each other in their pair. Oh. So let's take a look at a more complicated example. And this is one that's much more common. Let's say we've got HC, oops, sorry, I'm cheating here. How many proton signals will we have? Three. Three, right? So we can go through and we can label this and we can say HA, HB, and HC, right? Why aren't HC and HB equivalent? Yeah, that alkene can't rotate freely, so C is locked in a confirmation where it's cis to that fluorine, HB is cis to HA, so they're not in similar chemical environments. But what I want to do today is analyze HA and figure out what sort of peak HA will be represented as. So if we look at it, we could say, well, it has how many three-bond neighbors? Has two, right? So HA has a three bond neighbor that's HB, right? Mm -hmm. We can count three sigma bonds away. And then HC is also three sigma bonds away, but it's kind of in that trans direction. HC and HB will actually split HA with different coupling constants. So let's take a look at what I mean by this. What I mean is whoop, the coupling constant for A and C is not going to be equal the coupling constant for A and B, right? They're going to occur at different magnitudes. So let's imagine what's occurring here. So does that happen because one is cis and one is trans? Exactly. Yeah, I, we'll talk about this really quickly, but let's imagine our pre-split pre signal is represented by this line, right? HC will actually split it to a larger degree than HB because it's trans. It's common that trans alkenes have very wide coupling constants, where cis alkenes actually have narrow coupling constants. We're not really going to get into why, but it's just a good thing to remember that if it's trans, your coupling constant will be large. So let's go through and draw this. And let me count, right? Um, there we go. Sorry, I'm going to erase that. So imagine that HB, or sorry, HC, let me change my colors, is splitting our HA signal into a doublet, right? So HA got split by HB, or sorry, HC into a doublet. And so we can represent this and we can say, all right, actually, let me stay consistent with my colors. This is going to be our JAC coupling constant. Mm 
meaning HA was split by HC into this set of doublets. And then what happens next is that it will actually get split again. Oops. So HB will split this doublet into another set of doublets. So each peak from that original doublet got split into another doublet. So if we look at this, the signal shape will actually look like this, where you've got one doublet here, and then you've got another doublet over here. Whoop, let me clean this up. Does anybody know what we call this? Identical. We call it a doublet of doublets. <laughs> Both of these peaks, as drawn, would be the splitting pattern that we'd expect for HA. So HA, instead of showing up as a triplet, will actually show up as a doublet of doublets. You can also observe doublets of triplets, doublets of quartets, triplets of doublets, things like that. It, it can get really confusing, I'll admit that. Which brings me back to that multiplet signal. Do you guys remember that at the bottom of the page? Oftentimes when you get these super complicated patterns that don't make up a lot of sense and they're really hard to interpret, we'll call them a multiplet. Occasionally though, especially with alkenes, you will see signals that very clearly represent a doublet of doublets. Yep? Um, so you don't actually, I guess, see the, the HC peak in a way, is that right? So right now all we're doing is looking at HA. So the signal for HA won't be a singlet, it won't be a triplet, triplet, it will just be a doublet of doublets because HC is splitting it differently than HB. Okay. If we had two groups that had really similar coupling constants, it would appear as a triplet and not a doublet of doublets. Another way of thinking about it is imagine your doublet of doublets, we merge them closer together, closer together, and they overlap perfectly, it forms a triplet, right? However, when they don't have the same coupling constants, they will separate out into a doublet of doublets. That's kind of the phenomenon that we're occurring, that we're seeing here. Yep? Uh, but when we went through that yesterday, the, the reason we had three peaks was because there were three different combinations of spin. So how does that reconcile with this? So typically, this phenomenon has occurred most com or observed most commonly with alkenes because the coupling constants are very, very different depending on the cis or trans orientation. You don't observe it as frequent, frequently with alkanes. So if you're looking at sp3 hybridized carbons, we don't typically observe situations like this. This is most commonly observed with alkenes. But each of these peaks comes from something having um, spin, right? Yeah. So like the first peak would be like up, up, and then like, up, down, and then like down, up, down, down? Yeah, so if we look at HA, we could say, well, HC could be spin up or spin down. It's 50 50 probability, so that separates it out into a doublet. And then that doublet signal gets split again by HB because HB could be spin up or down. And so each one of those doublet individual peaks gets split into another doublet. I know it can make your head spin, but I just wanted to show you guys that this is an unusual situation, but you occasionally see it. I, I, <laughs> is they're putting me on the spot. Um, this is a fairly complicated example, but I did want to present it because you will see it on occasion in practice problems. Can you explain again why we don't have a triplet? Uh, <laughs> so HC is splitting it to a different magnitude. You see this? This coupling constant right here is larger than that coupling constant. That happens based on HC being trans to HA and HB being cis to HA. They have different coupling constants because of that. They split it to a different magnitude. Do you have a question, Chloe? So whenever they show up 
are they going to be like directly attached to each other? Or are they going to be separated throughout, like throughout the spectrum? So that way, the is because then they from the same hydrogen shouldn't they be like right beside each other? Uh, they're going to always be three bonds away, but they won't necessarily be coming off of the same carbon. They happen to be in this case. I mean, like on the chart, on the spectrum, whenever we get the readings, the two doublets are... Oh, yeah, the two doublets will be right next to each other. They won't be in radically different areas of the spectrum. They'll be like twin sister peaks that are doublets right next to each other. Yep. So, say that again? Yeah, in that case, we would only observe a doublet. If HB were a chlorine, we wouldn't get this weird splitting pattern. Okay. Yeah. The main thing in this case to point out is that JAC, meaning our trans coupling constant between HA and HC, is going to be larger than JH or AB, excuse me. So, I know it's kind of an odd example, but. I feel like I have to do due diligence by showing you guys the odd example at least once. All right, so let's go back to easier stuff. <laughs> so one thing that we haven't really talked about is where on the spectrum these peaks will show up. We know their relative area, right? Their ratio of integrals. We know the splitting pattern, whether or not it will be a doublet, triplet, et cetera. We know how to interpret number of signals, but we don't know where the heck they show up. And we call this chemical shift. That was a big sigh. <laughs> chemical shift is carefully defined using this symbol. Kind of, yeah, it's just a Greek symbol. Okay. It's the observed shift from TMS in Hertz times 10 to the 6 divided by the operating frequency of the NMR. Pretty intuitive, right? It does it for you, right? Yes. However, there, I believe, is a question in Sapling that asks you to calculate it. But this is the overall equation that we use. Does anybody know what TMS stands for? So we saw it in our protecting group scheme, right? What was it called then? Trimethyl silo. In this case, TMS is close to that, but a little bit different. TMS is now tetramethylsilane in this example. So basically, chemists around the world for a long time didn't have a standard. So somebody may say, well, my peak shows up at this chemical shift. And somebody else in France said, well, mine shows up at this chemical shift. And then finally, chemists got together and they said, we need to have a standard that is universal across the planet to define relative positions of chemical shifts. So with TMS, the nice thing is we only have one proton signal, right? We have 12 different hydrogens, but they're all in the exact same chemical environment. These protons are defined to always show up at zero. Exactly, it's just our calibration standard. So TMS, we oftentimes spike our samples with TMS so that we can see this peak associated with TMS and tell our computer, set that peak to zero. Shift everything else so that that peak's at zero. It's just our internal standard. All right, the other unusual thing with NMR is the scale is typically shown in PPM. So parts per million. It's a little bit different than our standard 
way of thinking. We normally think of parts per million as concentration, but when we use it for NMR, it's just the relative position of our chemical shift. So let's take a look at what I mean by that. You guys remember when I said the NMR scale typically goes from about 15 to zero? This scale is in ppm, and TMS will always show up here. Oop, zero ppm, not pppm. There we go. All right, there are two main factors that will influence where a peak shows up on this scale. So let's talk about those factors really quick. Let me slide this down. <laughs> Sorry, let me grab my keyboard so I can move this picture. The old one note would let me do this with my finger. But. at Microsoft. I'm trying to. Never upgrade from Windows 8, people. <laughs> Windows 10 is kind of glitchy. Yeah, 7's fine. Alright, I'm going to come back to this because I can't move it right now. <laughs> I apologize. So there are two main things that influence chemical shift. Chemical shift. Does anybody have an idea what one of them might be? What was that? Induction or polarity, right? So one easy, quick and dirty way you can look at the scale is you can say, all right, 0 to 15 ppm. Typically, more polar peaks show up at a higher ppm. All right? So if we've got a really non-polar proton, meaning it's attached to a carbon that doesn't have a big dipole, it'll show up close to 0 or 1. However, if it's bonded to something really electronegative, like a ketone or an aldehyde or something like that, it will oftentimes show up at a much higher ppm. So you want to look at the environment that that hydrogen or proton is bonded to. The second one is a little bit different. This is called anisotrop anisotropic effect. Why you always go to uh, some people draw it to 12, some people draw it to 10, 15 is about as high as you'll typically see a signal show up. So what you mean is the signal may usually appear on the 0 to 15? Yeah, that's the typical range for proton NMR in particular. But does that mean that if you have a bond that's less polar than like silicon, that's carbon or whatever, it would be less than 0? You will occasionally see negative peaks, but that's a rare, odd example. In, in our textbook, you really never see it. So 0 to 15 is a good scale. So in the anisotropic effect, you've got this weird phenomenon that has to do with ring current. So do you guys remember me talking about benzene rings? where I said that we've got this delocalized pi cloud kind of going above the ring up here and below the ring down here. So we've got this pi cloud both above and below our benzene ring due to all of those being sp2 bonds. Right? The problem with this is that 
these electrons will actually flow in essentially a current pattern, right? So imagine the top one is flowing um, counterclockwise, and same with the bottom one. It's almost like two little loop-de-doops of electrons above and below your ring. <laughs> loop-de-doops, that's the scientific term. What happens when we get charges moving around like that really quickly? Yeah, you get a magnetic field, right? So if we look at this, the odd thing that happens with these pi clouds when they're looping around in these p orbitals is that you form a magnetic field. It's called an induced magnetic field. This changes where protons show up in your spectrum, right? It can have really bizarre and unusual effects. However, in our case, we're going to be looking at a specific example. So let's redraw our scale. We've got 0 to 15. We've got 10. Oh, let me spread this out more. 5. What we're going to do is make this simple and essentially say that The protons coming off of benzene or other aromatic rings typically show up at 6 to 9 ppm. And that's due to this weird ring current that's changing the magnetic field around those protons, right? So if you think about this proton sticking out right here, it's being hit by the magnetic field that's caused by those p orbitals looping around. So it's an unusual phenomenon, but it gives you a really important clue, right? So if you're looking at an NMR and you see peaks between six and nine, that screams that you have some sort of aromatic ring in the system. And you can look at the splitting patterns in there and determine uh, the substitution pattern that is um, the result of that benzene ring. Does that make sense? Uh, you said it only happens if they're flowing in opposite directions, is that right? Or it only happens typically with aromatic rings. Okay. We could spend a long time talking about this. But for right now, the only aromatic ring we've really seen is benzene. Next term, we'll see some um, unique examples of aromatic rings that differ from benzene. Yeah, I was just making sure there wasn't like, if it's low in one direction, it'll show up somewhere else. No, yeah. All right, then the last one for NMR before we dive into practice problems is carbon 13 NMR. Carbon 13 NMR is a lot easier. There is no splitting, meaning, whoop, come on, what is going on? No doublets, triplets, etc. At least in terms of the carbon NMR that you will see. It's all decoupled carbon NMR, so you don't see any splitting that occurs with carbon NMR. It's a lot easier because of that. If we don't have splitting, what is the peak we have? You only see singlets. You don't see doublets, triplets, quartets, pentets. You only see singlets. How can we identify the peak is, is carbon certain or is it hydrogen? It's a different experiment that you run on your NMR. So you go into your control panel and say, I want to run a carbon NMR experiment. Uh, so the, uh, the NMR probably will be using different frequency to resonate the compound? Yeah, it's very different. And we'll talk about how it's different here, too. Just different setup. Yeah, different setup. So first thing is no splitting. Second thing is there's no integration. At least using simple NMR experiments, we don't integrate them because it's not a reliable source of number of carbons or their ratio. However, it does tell you something really important. It tells you the unique number 
of carbon sets. So just like the pod yesterday, I asked you guys to determine the chemically distinct protons and the chemi chemically distinct carbons. If you look at the carbon NMR, the number of peaks should correspond to the number of unique carbons that you see. So it's really useful for that. And then the last thing is that chemical shifts can be correlated to functional groups. So if you look at that handout that I gave you, let's pull it up. You'll see the carbon 13 portion is on the bottom. There's a couple of important things to notice. If we are thinking about proton NMR, we said the scale is from 0 to 15, roughly. If you notice with carbon NMR, the scale is much, much bigger. It goes all the way down to about 220, 240. And the relative range tells you whether or not that carbon is involved in a specific functional group, or at least it's a rough guide. So for example, let's say we see a peak that shows up in this region. We could say, well, that's strong evidence that we have either a ketone or an aldehyde. And that carbon belongs to the carbon that's involved in that carbonyl bond. If you've got a peak that shows up at a much lower frequency, let's say maybe around 15, 20-ish, that could be a methyl carbon. If it shows up a little bit higher, around 20 to 40, you could say, well, that's maybe a methylene carbon. So it's bonded to two hydrogens. So you can use this as a rough guide to identify the number of carbons that you see. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, can we see an example of what these look like? Of a carbon anemar? Yeah. All right. <laughs> so a ranking on things, how high the peak would be, right? Uh, no, the peak height means nothing. You're just looking for number of signals in a carbon anemar. What do you mean the ranking from the bottom to the top? It just tells you the functional group location, right? So the rough guide just is a rough guide for functional groups. Okay. All right, let's take a look at maybe some examples. Come on. Let's look at our example from lab. I'm going to pick a good one here. All right, so let's look at our handout from lab. The molecular formula I give you guys at the top of the page, I say it's C4H10-0. In this case, if we look at the carbon NMR, which is this top spectrum, how many peaks do we see? Four. four. So that means we have four chemically unique carbons. What does that imply about the um, symmetry of this molecule? There's no symmetry, right? Because if there were symmetry, we would have fewer signals than the molecular formula would indicate, right? If we have uh, incomplete symmetry or no symmetry, we would see all four of those carbons. So that gives you a hint too. So carbon NMR can be a very quick, useful tool. So the reason why we consider this char as a carbon NMR is just because it doesn't have any split? There's no splitting, there's no integration. You're just looking at number of signals and their relative location in terms of chemical shift. How so can, How can you know this is not a hydrogen char instead of the carbon char? Because we can look at the scale, right? If we look at the scale for this one, it's 0 to 200. We know that that's definitely not a proton NMR. Okay. Yeah. The other thing, too, you guys, is let's take a look at this. Do you guys think we'll have any aldehydes or ketones? No. Why not? There's no peak in that like 200 region where we typically see a carbon show up for an aldehyde or a ketone. So this can rule out a bunch of different functional groups if you're considering some of these for your lab. All right, so what I want to do is work through practice problems because I feel like that's when NMR really starts to click. So I have posted this on the handout, but I want to work through it as a class at first. Oops. And we'll continue this tomorrow too.
Oh, shoot. <coughs> Sorry, guys, I'm going to blow this up. Do we need to predict the height of the pit? Darn it. Whoa. There we go. <laughs> All right. For this first problem, do you think it's a carbon NMR or a proton NMR? Proton. The scale indicates 0 to 10. That's a lot uh, more likely that it's a proton NMR. I give you the molecular formula that's C6H6. First thing I do is I determine the HDI, right? So what do you guys think the HDI could be for this? What's our formula for HDI? <laughs> All right, so it's one half times what? Two C plus two minus H. We're gonna exclude the nitrogens and oxygens because we don't have any in there. So in this case, what will our HDI be? Four. Yeah, four. All right. So if we think about this, that can mean we have four rings in our system. Right? We could, theoretically, however, can we arrange C6H8 into four rings? No, it's impossible. The other alternative is we have three rings, one double bond, or we could have two rings, two double bonds. We could have one ring, three double bonds. We could have a triple bond and a ring. We could have any combination of pi bonds and rings that add up to four. What do you think is likely here? Yeah, a benzene ring, right? So oftentimes when you see really high HDIs, that indicates that you've got a benzene ring. What's our other clue that it might be a benzene ring? Well, let's think about chemical shift. We just talked about chemical shift. I told you guys chemical shift can tell you a lot about polarity or whether or not you have aromatic rings. If we look at this peak right here, We'd say that's showing up between 6 and 9 ppm. That's right where we'd expect aromatic peaks. So I heard somebody scream out, benzene. <laughs> Summer. <laughs> Here's benzene. Oh, shoot. Why doesn't benzene have six signals? Yeah, it's symmetric. It's got a bunch of different planes of symmetry. So whether or not you're in one proton position, it doesn't matter. All of the protons are in that same chemical environment. So if we look at this, we could label these all as HA. And we could say that this peak is HA. It's showing up in the correct region for our proton NMR. Everything's checking out so far. So it provides you a lot of clues. Let's do the next one. This one's trickier. What's that? Oh, well, we've got to kind of determine that. Sometimes it's not super clear. All right, so we've got 1 half 2C plus 2 minus H. We don't include oxygen in our HDI calculation, so what should the HDI be? So we've got two times three, that'd be six, plus two, that'd be eight, minus eight, is zero times one half is zero. This is why we have math prereqs at TCC. <laughs> So HDI of zero, that means we have no double bonds, no rings, no pi bonds, nothing like that. All right, so let's try to come up with a list of isomers. So C3, it could be this, right? It could be this. Are there any others? Could be that, right? Are there any others? Mm 
I'm trying to think of any. Anybody else think of any other possible isomers that would represent this? That's all I can think of. So let's go through. Let's analyze these different isomers and see which one would match this NMR spectrum. So let's start with our first one up here. How many proton signals should we see? Well, let's think about it. We'd have protons coming off here. The methyl group spins around, so that's unique. We'd have protons coming off of here. They're unique. We'd also have protons whoops, coming off here. They're unique. And then last but not least, we'd have this proton coming off over here. So we'd have four signals. If we look at our spectrum, we've got a signal here, signal here, and this signal it could be two singlets, but it looks like a doublet to me. I don't know if you guys agree with me on that. So to me, it looks like we've got three signals in our spectrum, not four. So that's some evidence that it doesn't work. The other thing we could do is we could analyze these peaks, right? These blue peaks over here, what should they be split as? Yeah, so if we look at the blue protons, they've got two three-bond neighbors. That means we should have a triplet. If we look at these green protons, what will they be split as? A sextuplet. A sextuplet. <laughs> Close. A sextet. Sextet means it gets split into a peak of six. What about this one over here? What will that be split as? triplet. We can't go through that oxygen. So the red one has two three bond neighbors. That will be split into a triplet. And then what about this one? It'll just be a singlet because it has zero three bond neighbors. So if we look at this, whoop, do you guys think that one propanol matches our spectrum? No, no not likely. So we can go through and we can say, well, this is not a good candidate for a spectrum. In fact, it's such a poor candidate, let's just erase it and let's look at our other one. All right, let's do our next one. How many proton signals would we expect for isopropanol? Okay, so let's identify them. We've got this proton, this proton, and this proton. We know methyl groups are always equivalent. Are there any others like it? Yes. The other side, because we've got a mirror plane. We've got this guy right here, there's no others. There's a hydrogen in the center. I can't tell you how many students forget about this little guy. Oh, a poor little guy. All right, so now let's go through and identify the potential splitting pattern. So let's start with this. What will it be split as? Doublet. Right. And what about this green one? <laughs> yeah, a septet because it gets split into a peak of seven. It has six three bond neighbors, so this will be a septet. So we don't we don't use it as high anymore. Nope. <laughs> because chemistry is not confusing enough, we came up with new prefixes for you to remember. All right, the red one. Singlet. All right, so if we look at our spectrum, do we have a septet, a doublet, and a singlet? Yeah, it looks to me like we definitely do, so I'd say this is really strong evidence. One question I have for you guys is why is our septet at four ppm, meaning it's really high on the ppm scale. Yeah, if we think about it, that green hydrogen or green proton is attached to a carbon that's also attached to an oxygen, so there's an inductive pull by that oxygen which forces it downfield, right? So again, this matches our prediction in terms of NMR chemical shift. Why is it strong in the polarity between 
So one thing with oxygen-hydrogen bonds that they don't do a great job of explaining in your book is because these oxygen-hydrogen bonds can hydrogen bond, they'll show up all over the place. They're, they don't typically show up in one distinct location permanently. They can show up in random locations. Anywhere from two to, I've seen them all the way up at four and a half. Yeah. All right, so do you guys think it's the ether? No. No, not the ether. One last thing I wanted to do while we're looking at this is look at our integration. If we look at our doublet, what should it integrate as? Six. six. We've got six protons for that blue set. So if we look at this, this peak would be 6H. It's pretty big, right? That looks right. If we look at this red one, it should integrate as one proton, which means it's going to be roughly one-sixth the area of that blue peak. And then our septet is also going to be, whoops, one proton, and it's just this little itty-bitty peak down below. So you can see the rough signal intensity is based on the number of protons that account for that peak. So if they're both one inch, why are they different? That's a good question. If you think about one peak that gets split into a doublet, the doublet peaks will be split into a smaller height, right? Mm -hmm. And if you split it all the way down to a septet, it's going to get shorter, 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 and shorter. It doesn't mean the area underneath has changed. Mm -hmm. It just means it's getting split into multiple small peaks. So it's, like it's what? Like exactly. All right, so tomorrow we're going to come in and just do all NMR practice. So make sure that you come tomorrow so that we can practice this in groups. Can you explain the number, the zero number? What is that?